Your future is nothing but the outcome of the decisions you make today, right? So you make better decisions today, your future will be more prosperous. You make the wrong ones, then your future will be full of struggles. So today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic, critical thinking and how it applies to problem solving. I'll give you a weird analogy here. So critical thinking uh, as an ability is like having an infrared goggles, right? And looking at the sky at night, you know, without it, you look at a space, you see only three things, right? You see, you see stars, sometimes you see planets and you see darkness. Right? But the moment you put on your infrared goggles, then you get to see all these beautiful gas clouds, you know, giant gas clouds and the dust is so colorful, right? So you get to see the things that were previously impossible to see. That's what critical thinking is. It lets you identify the actual problems, right? The root causes, but it also helps you see the opportunities. Now, Critical thinking isn't only obviously applicable at work, right? It's applicable to every single area of your life. But my channel is all about your career. So that's what we'll cover in this video. Now, we need a framework, right? And the framework starts with a problem statement. Problem statement is very similar to a project charter. You know, it includes goals, um, as in what are you trying to, to, to achieve, right? Your success criteria, as in how will I know if I succeeded or, or if I failed? Then you need um, assumptions, you need timelines and stakeholders. So this is, this is very similar to a project charter. I'm actually going to call it problem charter. Now, this document is, is, is very helpful for two reasons. And the second reason being a lot more important than the first one. But let's start with the first one. The first reason it's very, very helpful is because when you get engaged in that problem solving mode, you start uncovering a lot of other symptoms that may be caused by completely other causes, right? Um, so we're not interested in them at the moment, right? Um, you will document those, but you're not going to develop solution alternatives, right? Uh, and, and, and develop action plans for those, unless there are dependencies. So it, it, it helps you understand your, your scope, right? And who to deal with, the timelines. It basically keeps everything sort of uh, under control. But to be honest, uh, in my decade long consultant career, I noticed that the biggest help of having such a project charter, sorry, problem charter, is all about moving through bureaucracy. Let me explain. When you're going through problem solving stages, you actually do a lot of work, right? I mean, you summon meetings, you request data from various departments, you request uh, for expertise from consultants. So you're shaking things, hmm? you're moving things around. Now, what gives you the power to do that? What gives you the power to call all these people to a meeting room? What gives you the power to ask for certain analytics data from, from completely other departments, the different departments, right? Why should they attend that meeting or give you that data that you want? Because they like you? They want to help you? What if they don't like you, right? Now, if you're a senior employee, um, you're a manager, director, VP, then it's fine, right? I mean, of course, everyone will come into that meeting and give you the data you want. But if you're not that senior, right? What if you're not that senior? I mean, where does your power come from? It comes from that document, the problem charter right? Corporate companies are, um, they, they, they are, they're not very agile usually, right? I mean, they move slowly and the employees are usually very, they're not lazy, but they push back. They don't want to stop what they're doing and join your little problem solving brainstorming session and go through your little PowerPoint slides, right? Or do a fishbone analysis. They got their own thing to worry about. Right. So if you have a problem charter, right, only a few pages signed off by a sponsor, someone senior, right, then you have the power to get the data you want and bring in the experts and call for the meetings and spend money for consultants. That's where your power comes from. Okay, now let's continue. Now you develop the problem statement, you got your buy-in from someone senior, and you're off to solving the problem. Good. The second step in your critical thinking towards a problem is now identifying the root causes, right? 
we want to we want we want to look at the 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 symptoms or the consequences and walk backwards and until we reach the 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 root causes and there are various ways you can do this i mean you can use a fishbone analysis for relatively more complex problems or for simple problems you can have uh, five whys now the five why whys is made famous by toyota uh, toyota production system and as the name suggests you you ask why 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 until you get to a potential root cause very simple stuff but what is not so simple is knowing when to stop you see it's not necessarily at the fifth question uh, because you can actually ask infinite amount of whys right there's always a layer down it, it never actually ends i mean <laughs> if you have children then you probably know what i'm talking about so five is just an arbitrary number don't take it literally Good, let's run an example, right? Um, it'll be crystal clear soon. Uh, it's going to be an actual problem. <laughs> it's actually a problem that um, got me into a lot of trouble in the past. So the situation is that when I was at PwC Consulting, every time we have a downtime, uh, meaning when we are not doing the client work, uh, we would engage in other, other work like research and uh, you know writing thought leadership pieces um, or delivering pro bono speeches or, 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 or write proposals for new projects. Now, there was this one time um, when I couldn't finish the proposal on time. And as a result, uh, we couldn't submit the document to the client and clients or potential client excluded us from the bids. Now, right there, that's potentially a million dollar loss for the firm. Because if we could just submit, I mean, we would most probably win the project. Um, this whole thing entirely was was my mistake. I was leading the proposal development. I was the manager and I had two senior associates working for me. So it was a big failure. I mean, <laughs> I messed up real good. Um, it's, it's, it's really rare that anyone can say they cost their employer a million dollars. I can. Um, and it's even probably more rare that they don't get fired. I didn't. It definitely a career milestone for me there. Not, not something you can see on my CV though. But anyway, let's let's ask some whys, right? Let's analyze why I messed up. Let's apply the five whys. So Dennis says, uh, we couldn't deliver the proposal on time. Okay, Dennis, why? Hmm, it took us more time than I expected. Why? Well, I estimated the time requirements, like how long it would take, uh, based on previous similar projects. So I looked at the previous RFPs and the request for proposals and, and, and our proposal development time, um, and that's how I estimated. Mm. Now stop, because it's a dead end. Don't ask more whys, because it's the best practice to, to estimating the time requirements of a proposal based on the, the, the previously similar ones, right? So then is, that the, this is such a weird example, <laughs> did the right thing, right? So, it, because if you ask one more why, it will be detrimental. W why did you look at the past RFPs? Because it's the best practice. Oh, see my point? So it was the right action to take, but it, it was implemented poorly. So I did the right thing by looking at the previous RFPs, but I did a poor job in terms of analyzing the scope of work. I didn't realize there was a small part of the scope uh, involved expertise in social security systems, which I didn't know much about. So, so I had to work with our London team and then the whole communication back and forth. I, I, I just wasted so much time, right? Good, let's run one more example. Um, let's do IT. I'm not in IT, but let's give, give one example from IT. Let's say our software is slow in responding to inputs. First, why? Okay. Um, why? Because the server is overloaded. Why? Because we had a sudden peak in traffic. Why? Because we got featured in a tech magazine and um, that resulted in massive traffic boost. Don't ask anymore. You're done, right? Um, I mean, it would be idiotic to ask more whys. Why did you get featured in tech magazine? It's a great thing for the business, right? See, it makes no sense. <clears throat> Instead, at that stage, um, a better question to ask is, why didn't we anticipate this and put in place the contingency capacity in our server, 
right? And if you ask that question, then the answer to that would be negligence, a human error, hmm? or lack of standard operating proce procedures like SOPs, like whatever works. But it's a different question at that moment. Now I want to talk more about finding root causes, because if you noticed, the problems I shared with you were fairly simple ones, right? I mean, the, the, the reason they were so simple was because there's a direct chain, direct connection between the consequence and, and the root cause. Y because of X, Y X because of Z, Y Z, that's the root cause, right? So it, it, it was fairly simple. But in real life, it so happens that sometimes problems can't be found by looking at the consequences or the symptoms. Right? The, the, the root cause lies completely elsewhere. Right? There's no direct link between the root cause and, and, and the, and the uh, symptom. So in those situations, where do you even start? Right? Let me give you an example um, of a problem that we faced very recently. Um, that was actually the problem, the, the, the reason why of my absence from YouTube for a while. Um, let me share with you what happened and how we eventually identified the root cause. It's, it's a weird one. Now, you probably already know about my LIG program. It's landing in twos guaranteed. Um, horrible name. I know. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> so I left PwC Consulting around four months ago uh, to fully focus on my LIG program. And I usually spent, you know, most of my day, day helping LIG members get better jobs or pass their interviews, right? It's, it's an awesome program. And I usually get about 10 to 15 new registrations every day. And LIG is the reason why this entire YouTube channel uh, exists, right? So I can have an opportunity to talk about it, uh, which I should do more often. Anyways, now, about three weeks ago, something really bad happened, right? I mean, so having about 10 to 15 registrations every day, all of a sudden we got nothing, right? No enrollees, nothing. Comes the next day, nothing. Third day again, nothing. Fourth day again, nothing. I mean, you can imagine how I felt, right? Uh, it's my livelihood. Right? I mean, it's uh, I left a pretty amazing career with PwC and took a big risk with LIG and a career mastery, and it's all crashing down. I mean, think about how how it is at that moment for me. It's like war mode. So for about four days, I got nothing more than five hours of sleep combined. I was a walking zombie, constantly asking, why, 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 right? You know the five whys? As well, they became 500 whys, 5,000 whys. So the first question is, is like, is it, is it the payment processor? Nope, we tested it, it worked fine. Is it the traffic? Is it, is it traffic to the site down? Are people not coming? Nope, they're up. Okay, I mean, we check Google Analytics, it's all fine. Is it the server? Is the server down? Nope, we checked the server logs, it was all fine. There was no downtime, even in peak times. I mean, me and Jeanette, we were, uh, we literally came up with more than 100 potential causes, right? And we ran test, test for every single one of them. No sleep, four days, nothing, it's crazy. Now, after four days of constant struggle, like constant effort, right? Um, I got really depressed. I mean, no sleep, nothing, right? So I, I didn't even know who to go to to solve this problem. Like, who's the person that can help, help us understand? So in my misery, I went home to my sweet couch, opened up a bottle of vodka, I grabbed the whole bottle, you know, just sat down and turned on my TV. And literally, I picked the most depressing movie of all time, Hachiko. If you're a dog owner, I don't care if you're the toughest person alive, that, woman, that movie will make you cry your eyes out. It's that depressing. So I started watching Hachiko, and um, after watching an hour, all of a sudden, a very interesting idea came to my mind. Was I somehow hacked? Was like the whole thing, was that a hack, a sophisticated hack? It was. The hackers somehow made everything look normal to us, right? All the visitors from two cities I live in, Dubai and Vancouver, uh, everything looked fine if you enter from those cities. But anyone else who come to the site, they would see a maintenance uh, maintenance note. Site, site, the site is under construction note. They even put a weird video uh, to make the visitors stay in the site a bit longer, so I wouldn't understand by looking at the Google Analytics user behavior data. We got hacked. It took us four days to realize that, um, and a bottle of vodka. 
<laughs> anyway, I understood the root cause not because I follow the fishbone diagram or five whys. I asked 500 whys, 5,000 whys. Do you know why I was able to solve the problem? And can you guess why that potential root cause popped in my head? Think about it. Let's get nerdy a bit. I was able to solve the problem because my brain waves changed. I didn't do it purposely, but I'm glad I, it did. When I relaxed after four days and stopped focusing on the problem, my brain waves turned from being predominantly uh, beta to alpha. Now, you need to know this. There are four types of uh, brain frequencies, right? You know, these are like the frequency bands. So we have beta, and beta is when your brain uh, emits between 14 to 20 cycles per second of electrical impulse, right? Then we have alpha, which is between 17, sorry, 7 to 14 uh, cycles per second. Then we have theta and delta. And uh, for with, with data, data, you go into uh, deep sleep. Now, the beta waves are what gives us the logical thinking, the problem solving, right? Uh, managing our daily activities. Beta is your like, it's like your management consultant. Mm? But the problem is in crisis situations, your beta waves go into overdrive, right? Our heads have, uh, you know, they, they have full of multiple thoughts competing for our attention. Is it the server? Is it the payment processor? Is it the domain? Is it the traffic? Look at the Google Analytics. That's when you are very logical and analytical. But when beta is in overdrive, your creativity goes down to zero, right? So if there's no logical connection between the problem, problem and the root cause, uh, then you will fail to create that bridge. That's exactly what happened to me for four days straight. No sleep, nothing, constantly problem solving mode, right? Calling the server company, the payment provider, Google, looking at user metrics and charts and the server logs, constant battle. Mm? But then somehow, when I relaxed the fourth day in my couch, the brain relaxed and it started emitting electrical pulses in alpha frequency, it was done with beta. And alpha brain waves are the bridge between our conscious and subconscious mind. Mm? Alpha brain wave is like, it's like Steve Jobs, right? Your creative side and the beta is like your management consultant. So it's the waves responsible for bringing that great idea from the back of your head, right? It, it, it just pops up. So that's, that's what happened. And, um, and that beta waves, uh, sorry, alpha waves all of a sudden created this absurd suggestion. I got hacked? What? Hmm. That's interesting. Now the example is done. Let's continue with our framework and let's briefly talk about developing and evaluating alternatives. Let's go back to the proposal example, right? So we identified the problem and uh, the root cause was the fact that I wrongly estimated how long it would take to prepare uh, the proposal, right? I looked at the past examples, fine, uh, but I didn't properly analyze the scope of work. Now, let's move on to the third stage in our problem solving, which is the fact that we need to develop a few solution alternatives. So in our example, the objective is to make sure that it never happens again, that I or any of the managers uh, never miss a single submission date or for, for proposals. So let's write down a few alternatives, right? So alternative one, let me read it. Right. So alternative one, we can add 20% uh, contingency time, uh, contingency time reserve to all future proposals. So if we think it's going to take four days, uh, then we can schedule five days for the proposal development, right? Alternative two. Uh, we can hire a proposal manager, someone who will help us develop the proposals on time. You know, that person is going to be like a project manager. Mm. Not a bad idea. Another alternative is we can add more resources to the proposal development team. For example, if it is uh, one manager and two senior associates, it could be one manager and three or four senior associates. Now, which of these alternatives, right, the, the amongst the three, is the best one. Think about it. Can you evaluate? You can't. Not yet. Because to evaluate anything, we need criteria. In this situation, I'll have four criteria. The first one is the potential impact, the positive one, right? And then the second one is the potential threat, the complete opposite. 
And the third one could be maybe ease of implementation. And the final one would be maybe alignment with our overall strategy. And just a deep note here, uh, you may also assign weight scores to each criterion. For example, you may want to give more weight towards ease of implementation, um, you know, than alignment with strategy. It depends on your needs. So it would be like 30% weight for, for uh, impact, 30% weight for potential threats, 35% weight for ease of implementation, and 5% weight for um, the alignment with strategy. So from the potential future per, uh, impact perspective, uh, I see no difference between the alternatives. Um, they will all get the job done. Not necessarily better or worse, probably. But from a potential threat perspective, um, hiring a new person is costly, right? Uh, it's a cost-intensive solution, so it'll cost us another hundred thousand dollars a year. Whether it, whether or not it justifies, we don't know at this stage. Um, and the other one is ease of implementation. And now, from the ease of implementation standpoint, adding the alternative A, uh, the first one, adding twenty percent time contingency, is the easiest one. I mean, this means these teams, team members, will get back to their projects uh, just a day later, right, instead of four days or five days. And that's also not certain, right? It's just a contingency. We may never tap into that extra day. So once we run the complete evaluation, the overall winner is recommendation A, which is adding 20% contingency time reserve in our schedules. Now, we're not done yet. We know the winner. The final stage in our problem solving uh, is to create an implementation plan or an action plan. Now, this is super simple in our case. Um, your case may be different, but in our case, uh, all we need to do is send out an internal memo to all the relevant parties, uh, all the partners and the managers, whoever is doing the proposals, and let them know about the new procedure. Or, 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 or we may need to update our manuals or SOP, standard operating uh, procedures. That's it. But if the action plan you need to take is more complicated, then you need to approach it as a project and run it as a project. I have... Um, I have a video on project management fundamentals, so if you haven't watched it before, uh, it's really good. Um, just searched that video in my channel. Okay, we're almost done. Let me just quickly recap. Start with the problem statement, uh, the problem charter, right? We do that because we want to get a buy-in so we can use the resources and move things around, right? We have the power. Step two, identify the root causes. There are various techniques available to you here, including the fishbone and the five whys. Um, and many others, uh, but for most simple projects, you can always do five Ys, but remember not to take it literally. Five is just an arbitrary number. Step three is develop potential solutions. Just jot them down, right? Don't think about whether they would work or not. Not, not at that stage. Step four, evaluate these alternatives based on the criteria you developed, such as potential threat, the impact, uh, ease of implementation, whatever works for you. And you may also put different uh, weighting structure there. Um, and the final one is executed. So if it's something simple, don't complicate it. Just send out a memo, update the manual. If it's a complex solution, then treat it as a project. We're done. Uh, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope you benefited from this video. See you next week.